Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning in to the show today. Don't forget, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by the Inception Radio Network, where you can hear us live well, for the next two weeks on Friday afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m. Central Standard or Eastern Standard Time. But starting January 3rd, we'll be moving to Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So mark that on your calendar. But you can always listen to the archive shows. Um, you can check those out at Just Energy Radio, um, where we have... It will be six years worth of archives or check out our YouTube channel or you can come back here where you can listen to the archives or listen to the show that is re-aired on the network. Um, next week is the big day or hopefully not the big day. It'll be December 21st, 2012. And just in case the world doesn't come to an end and we're all hanging out going, well, what are we going to do next? We'll be here broadcasting live on Just Energy Radio, and we're opening up the phone lines, and we'd like to hear your thoughts about what the whole 2012 thing was. You know, are you happy nothing happened? Are you sad nothing happened? Did you buy 50 cases of beans, and they're sitting in your garage, and now you don't know what to do with them? You know, did your neighbor build a bunker? We want to hear everything. You know, what you think happened, why do you think we got sucked into this whole thing, and where are we going in the future? So I think it's a really important show. It is not meant to be a serious show, so we're hoping that you will join me and my co-host, John Michael Greer, as we just take the opportunity to breathe and laugh at ourselves at the silliness, because obviously if we're still here, nothing happened. Um, also, the first of the year is coming up. So it might be a good time to check in with what's going on in your life and what you need to do as you move forward um, after December 21st, 2012. You know, so uh, check, you know, it might be a time to schedule a session with me to take a look at that. You know, so to find out about the services I offer, please do go to www.soulhealer.com. And don't forget, it's not too late to order your copy of Man Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. You can get it in time. It makes a great stocking stuffer. And as always, if you get them directly from me, as opposed to Amazon.com, Kindle, or BarnesandNoble.com, it will come autographed. And that's priceless. So today, great show. In the first hour, we're going to be talking with Tobias Churton about his book, The Mysteries of John the Baptist. And in the second hour with Gene Manning uh, with a new topic for this show, uh, free energy. Hmm. So let me tell you a little bit about Tobias and we will get him on the air. <clears throat> Tobias Churton lectures on topics such as Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. He is the founding editor of Freemasonry Today and um, has written the books Gnostic Philosophy, the... Magus of Freemasonry, The Invisible History of the Rosicrucians, and his new book, The Mysteries of John the Baptist. He's also the founder and editor of Freemasonry Today magazine. So his webpage is TobiasChurton.com, and please welcome Tobias to the show. Hi, Tobias. How are you doing today? Very good, thanks, Rita. Dying to speak to you. So did I say your last name right? Well, it's a T in it, Churton. 
Church. Uh, I was Church. close. I was yeah, close. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> like Hampton. Good place to live. <laughs> okay. So let's let's start easy because you're a new guest to the show. And I, I always like to get a little history. You know, how did you become interested in Freemasonry? And then on top of that, John the Baptist in the first place. Wow, that's a huge question. I'll try the first one first. How did I get interested in Freemasonry? Do you know, I'm not sure. I, I, my grandfather was a Mason, and there was always a mystery about it. And when I was growing up, I was attracted to mysteries. And uh, there was always a com- Whenever Freemasonry would be mentioned, there'd be sort of the idea that there was a hidden secret in ourselves or somewhere to the, <laughs> to the, to the illogic of life. And uh, so there was always a kind of residual sense of what the, what's going on there. But uh, uh, I then developed that uh, when I was a student at Oxford studying theology. And I was very interested in esoteric theology. I went beneath or beyond uh, the apparent message. Is there an apparent, you know, some would say, well, the apparent message is enough. And I'd think, well, no, it obviously isn't enough because I'm a very dissatisfied member of the human race. I want to know what's really going on. I'm not prepared to sort of swallow the pill. Um, what was the second question? Uh, how did I get into John the Baptist? Well, mm-hmm. it, came out, it came out of the masonry. I, because I've, I've written some things on masonry, um, which some people seem to find useful, I got invited by Alexandria Lodge Number 22, Washington, D.C., which is the lodge that George Washington was a member of for a time and has some status in American masonry. And they asked me to come over and give their annual talk. And the the date of the tour was John the Baptist Day. And they said it was John the Baptist Festival. Well, in English Freemasonry, we don't have a John the Baptist Festival. So I was immediately interested. And I thought, well, what what am I going to talk about? There's so many aspects I could could talk about. And I thought, well, why not find out why there is a John the Baptist Festival in Masonry and talk about that? And I got into that subject, and I was quite amazed by the way I was taken by it. I, I thought I'd, I was in charge of my own um, destiny, but I, I felt I'd stepped on a train taking me somewhere else. And, and it, it eventually wouldn't let me go. I had to write a book about it. But Tobias, come on. John the Baptist, a Freemason? How could that possibly be? Baptist was a Freemason. The question was, why, why was it that Freemasons in America still held the name of John the Baptist as a festival name, whereas masonry in England didn't. And I, that was the first point of departure, was why, 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 why did anyone care? What was the connection between Freemasonry and John the Baptist? That was the first issue to, to look at. And what I found was the first ever meeting of Freemasons in England uh, who called themselves the Grand Lodge in 1717 met on John the Baptist. 24th of June, that's the summer solstice in 1717, and they had a sort of summer shindig. And that date, John the Baptist Day, was, for those people, a traditional uh, date where they'd celebrated their, their masonry. And, um, but over the next 20 years, the Grand England uh, really turned against the idea of celebrating this day there was a revolt against it in 1751. A group of mainly Irish Masons in London set up their own Grand Lodge called the Ancients. And they seemed to be quite keen on that this day. And they thought that having uh, the denigration was a real loss. And the Ancients form of Masonry, which was very successful in the colonies. So a lot of soldiers and, air- and sailors took it over, ran the old empire at the time. And uh, ancient style masonry was planted in America. And that, that's the, the first reason why the John the Baptist Festival is still recognized as such in the United States in some lodges. So it's fascinating how these spiritual traditions, which have very obscure and extraordinary origins, come through even with no great institutional support. Why did they care? that John the Baptist Day, 24th of June, the summer solstice, was recognized. What, what, was, what, would they, what had touched them? And, and that, that, that intrigued me and, and sent me on my journey for the book. 
Well, I just think that it's interesting that you're finding a connection between John the Baptist and the solstice in general. I mean, I would never have put the two into the same sentence, you know, considering Christianity, you know, has stepped away from even recognizing the solstice as being anything important, you know, other than, you know, Jesus' birthday or Easter or, you know, some religious tradition, you know, religious celebration. I mean, how does John the Baptist even tie to the solstice? I mean, that seems even like kind of a big stretch. Yeah, the thing is, Rita, that you and I are living in a post-Reformation Western world uh, before Luther's split with Rome, which took place in 1517. The church, the Christian church, the Western Christian church, Catholic church, uh, had to make some kind of arrangements with the indigenous beliefs of people in Europe that they wanted to impress. And one of the methods they used, consciously or conscious or not, was to take pagan festivals, so-called, original um, nature festivals, and join them to the names of Christian saints. And this is a process which we have very little record of, but we know that it's intriguing that one of the main dates of the old pagan, uh, the natural cycle uh, concept, was the summer solstice, when we are closest to the sun, the the life giver of our particular system. And they decided that that was the birth date, not the death date, which was normal in saints' days, the birth date of John the Baptist. And they had some scriptural support because the gospel suggests that John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. So it works out very nicely. You have John born at the summer solstice, 24th of June, and Jesus <laughs> is born at the winter solstice, uh, which is around 25th to 27th of December. So that kind of worked rather nicely. It made a a nice liturgical year and Christianized all the excitements over the rebirth festivals, which which were the popular celebrations when people let their hair down in midsummer, which was the period before the harvest. So they they had a kind of restfulness. And it's the time of our, everyone knows what a honeymoon is. Uh, If anyone who's been on a honeymoon probably doesn't know why it's called a honeymoon, probably thinks because I call my loved one, hello, honey. It's, It's because it was the summer solstice was the time for the best time to collect honey. And you also have this connection of masons with the idea of busy bees. But the honey moon was when the moon had a particular luster that excited people. So that was associated with a very good time to give birth, to suckle babies, and uh, to to celebrate uh, uh, the, the coming back of the life force. So church was quite clever to link that in with John the Baptist, so he becomes kind of Lord of the Solstice. And, and I didn't mean to be chuckling in the background when you were talking about, well, there is the six-month difference, and that puts him at the summer solstice, because I just really kind of find that amusing. I'm sorry, because we know that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. That was kind of a constructed date. Um, mm. you but know, it had so, a lot of meaning, you see. It had a lot of meaning to people. Well, right, I understand that, and I'm like, okay. It just makes me chuckle. Okay, yeah. not on the inside part, on, you know, kind of outside. Right. Was, was John the Baptist a Freemason? No. Uh, well, do we know whether there were sodalities um, in that, that period, the early first century, that may have distant and uh, remote connections with the Masons of the Middle Ages? Well, I don't know. Um I think that he may well have been an Essene. And the Essenes were a mystical uh, sect, if you like, of Judaism that you may have heard of. And uh, they had an organization which has a lot of similarities to, oddly enough, to Masonry. And I would be the last person to say that there's any link other than uh, something in our subconscious which makes certain ideas attractive. But the principles of the Essenes are very close to the simple principles of masonry, which is uh, the love of truth, the love of virtue and charity and love of God. And the Essenes, according to the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, held these principles. But I don't, I, don't, I don't think John went around thinking he was a Freemason, but there are odd things. There are many. He didn't uh, have one of those cute pins or anything? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that the spiritual movements of the first century were really spiritual, and I think uh, modern masonry is 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 the is 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 the detritus of that spiritual life. We have, as it were, the outward symbols, but the masons largely have forgotten or lost contact with, or are simply just clearly ignorant of the spiritual origins of these symbols. And if we want to find the meaning of the symbols, we have to go back to the periods when the symbols were were formed. And that's that's a kind of intellectual archaeology which takes many years to accomplish. And you, you get you never get the whole picture, of course. It's like trying to reconstruct your great 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 grandparents. You might have a photograph, but you don't really know what they thought of the morning paper, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's very hard to get these connect you know, we can we can I think the investigation is worthwhile. For me, it was very worthwhile. I think the book revealed to me uh, something that people today can relate to spiritually. Well, I, I've heard, you know, that they have identified um, the, uh, the, the, I don't remember his name, but the, the first mason was the builder of Solomon's temple. You know, and so, I mean, that, so I was like, well, you know, if that guy could be the the originator of the Masons, then John could have been in that lineage, you know. But I mean, do you? Let me pose the question in a different way. I mean, do you think that Masonry actually goes as far back as some people claim to the builder of Solomon's Temple? No, clearly not. The organizations that we have today, we can. Uh, the, the the earliest we can sensibly go back would be to around about 1638, and and some there are there are indications before, but there are also Masons charges from the 15th century, and there is some evidence from the late 14th century. That's uh, that's that's quite early in in European history. But then you you know if you want to try and traverse back from the 1370s back to the biblical period, the New Testament period, we're talking 1300 years with very little go on so it'd be of course it'd be absurd to suggest there's any direct link what seems to be more interesting is that certain symbols and ideas recur in human beings at different times and there may be some evidence of that happening or not but no institutional continuity no i think that's that's a romantic fantasy people like to to think about that it's too long ago there aren't the records no um we you can the trouble is you can always build more on a little than a lot. If you have a few indices, a few ideas, you can, you can make wonderful speculations. If you've got more information, you're root, much more rooted to the facts. And I've made it my business to, to get to know the facts of early masonry. But with those facts come symbols and spiritual ideas which are also living in people over longer periods. And there, may, there doesn't have to be an institution with an address and a phone number for those ideas to become activated through different points of time. But no, of course not. You can't take masonry back to the the Egyptian period on an institutional level. But obviously people who build things seem to think in particular ways. We can't escape from the facts of geometry, for example. If you were going to build a pyramid, you had to use geometry. If you're going to build a cathedral in the 14th century, many, many, you know, two, three thousand years later, you're going to use geometry. If you're going to build a skyscraper in New York, you're going to use geometry. There's a whole connection of mentality, idea, factual and scientific basis to what you're doing. So, so with that science, you also get spiritual ideas that come through. And what I was trying to do with John the Baptist was to show that for some reason, the, the, he still as a figure has an importance which the Christian Orthodox tradition has tended to put down. Uh, he's, he's the herald, he announces Jesus, and then he's supposed to disappear. But he hasn't. And my book is really about that hasn't. It's about why hasn't he disappeared, and why did they want him to disappear, and can we possibly reconstruct some idea who was the Masonic section of the book is only the introduction to it. It's not at all the meat of the book is really about an investigation into all the knowledge we can possibly have about an extraordinary man that Je- Jesus is reported to have said, no man was ever born of woman. I mean, that's, that's, that, how's that for an endorsement? You know, imagine if they said that about somebody like Simon Jesus. <laughs> and yet he's, 
he's turned into a cartoon figure in all the movies. Robert Ryan, Charlton Heston, some guy in a million BC, bearskin, uh, hang, hanging around in a river, um, echoing. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, revived. And I think he's been denigrated as such. And the history shows a much more nuanced and fascinating picture of him. And in the very general sense, kind of in an overview, Todd, because we're going to get into this much more deeper, um, who was John the Baptist? John called the Baptist, Johanan, his name, Johanan, means God comforts. He comes from a priestly background. He was famous not just as a figure in the Christian Gospels. He was written about by the main Jewish historian of the first century, Josephus, and he writes about him as a man of great honor who had a political role in first early first century Judea and Galilee and who challenged the Roman uh, stooge in Galilee, Herod Antipas. He challenged him on a point of law, a point of holy law, in exactly the same way as the biblical prophet Elijah challenged King Ahab. He challenged him, he said that his marriage to Herodias, his, his, his brother's wife, was illegal. And this pending marriage caused actually a war, which is not mentioned. The New, the New Testament ignores all the politics because it's, I suspect it's embarrassing. And in fact, it led to his death. Uh, it was a uh, what you say, a political um, necessity, Herod Antipas. According to Josephus, Herod Antipas had him executed uh, as a kind of, well, if we don't do it now, it's going to get worse later because he's got a big following and I don't want this man on my on my back anymore. But the, by, the, the, the New Testament picture simplifies that into an uh, Herodias did it. And there's the thing about the dance, who's not named Salome, you may have heard of the dance of the seven veils. And it's a very romanticized picture we get in uh, the New Testament. The fact is that he was a major, if he was like a Thomas More, if you've ever seen the film The Man for All Seasons, Thomas More challenged the VIII's right to separate from the Church of Rome and marry uh, Anne Boleyn. And this is the kind of guy we're talking about. John was a major political religious figure. Israel at this time, Judea at this time, was very much like Iran today, where the mullahs, uh, the priests, had a political role. Uh, you couldn't separate politics from religion. If you wanted to gap people, you told them a religious explanation for why things were happening and, and what you should do. And the first, the early first century is full of uh, torment and and uh, uh, overblown uh, excitement and enthusiasm around the temple. John was was part of that. We think of him as a man of the wilderness, and, and maybe with, with a lot of good reason, but it's gone too far. This idea that he was some, somebody who lived out in the desert, I don't think that's entirely correct. He was a man who was, the de <laughs> it's not very far, actually, to get to the desert from Jerusalem. He, he was, he was a, according to Josephus, he was a political figure, and whose death uh, was accounted by the public as the reason why Herod Antipas lost, lost a war. Uh, with the king of Nabatea, which was an Arab kingdom to the south of Jerusalem, which was very important politically at the time we're talking about. Um, New Testament removes all this politics, doesn't like it, because the New Testament, the, the Gospels, are written much later. And to bring in all this Roman stuff and history and imperialism and what the, all of that would have made Jesus himself look as a sort of terrorist suspect to, to Roman <laughs> Oops. Well, and I think, you know, your point about um, John calling Herod out on account of Jewish law, you know, if Herod was kind of representing, uh, you know, the highest role of Judaism for him to be caught up in such a scandal. I mean, today it's kind of like, you know, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. You just don't want that getting out there. You've got it in a nutshell. That's exactly the, the case. I mean, I mean, Clinton couldn't have uh, Monica put away, um, but he did send his, in, in, in uh, Herod Antipas sent his wife to her holiday home, which was the castle of Machiris, which according to the New Testament, people think is a sort of dungeon, but was actually a rather, a rather, a rather nice sort of mount, mountaintop resort. And from there, she was lifted 
Phasilis, his real wife, Herod Antipas, who is not mentioned in the Gospels. Phasilis, Herod Antipas's wife, was lifted from there by King Aretas, taken back to Nabatea. And if you don't know what I mean by Nabatea, everybody's seen probably and Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. That temple at the end is actually was built by Aretas the Fourth, and he was the father of Herod Antipas's wife, and they they lived out, out there, which was not far from Machaerus. But the but the Gospels uh, are not interested <laughs> in that story. It's it's fascinating, um, the material that the Gospels use and the, the material they like, the material they don't like. There's a filtering going on. Well, yeah, and we're going to get into that because I think that's a very interesting take on the whole story itself is, you know, what's their perspective versus what did they leave out? Um, you know, but I think if they put in all of that intrigue, it would take the focus off of Jesus being the main character, the main person in the narrative and give you all this other stuff to think about and, and wonder. Yeah. Yeah, they don't want to do that. <laughs> Gee, I mean, by the time the, the, the Gospels are written, I mean, Jesus is already on his way to becoming a uh, slightly out of this world figure. And, um, it, you know, it, it, at that point, too much, too much history gets in the way. Very much when figures are raised to great prominence. Nobody really wants to hear the dirty washing of the family or the clean washing of the family or the fact that they even had a family. Um, there's always this, whenever, you know, a figure enters mythology, they become slightly inhuman. Uh, in some cases, superhuman. In other cases, subhuman. Or in other cases, you know, completely alien. And, um, you, you know, John is one of the victims of that process because he was a major figure. Jesus, by all, the only accounts we have, seemed to think he was great. But then we have Paul come along in the next, not quite generation. He's coming along a few years later and he's saying, but uh, John's baptism was only of water. Ours is of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, why is he saying that? What's, what's, what's going on there? There's a, there's, 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 a, there's a mystery. That's why I call the book The Mysteries of John the Baptist. There are a lot of questions. Some we can get near an answer. Some remain mysterious, you know. But John is a mystery man. He's, a, he's obviously an extraordinary character. Um, a lot of material is built up about him in, in, in the Gospels. And then he just, he's meant to disappear. Get off stage. You know, you've done your bit. You know, but, I, <laughs> but, but John's been taken up by various... Uh, traditions through time as 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 being a highly significant character in Islam and in and Christianity. Uh, normative Judaism never had a chance to take him on because he was linked up with the the Christian story. So, you know, if you speak to a rabbi, he's not really terribly interested in a man that many thought was the last great prophet. But then again, if he was one of the, uh, if he was in a scene also, and if Jesus was in a scene, you know, the whole, it seems like uh, the traditional Jewish congregation that was in uh, Jerusalem at the time didn't really take their teachings and take their message and bring it into mainstream traditional Judaism. Well, I don't think in the first century there is a mainstream traditional. Judaism. I think that was something that came, came much later. I think that what you had was there had been a shattering of uh, the Jewish religious community. There had been a breakdown uh, and a split, uh, I think, between the rival priestly groups, some of whom supported the, the deal with Rome, which uh, Herod, the father of Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, had worked out um, in order to get uh, credit with Mark Antony. The famous Mark Antony was a friend of Herod. And uh, they divided up the spoils of, I mean, Herod the Great wasn't even a, a full Jew. He married into the Hasmonean dynasty and was regarded as very much a uh, quizzling, an interloper. What's he doing? And yet he was appointing who the high priest was. So you've got a complete shattering of the religious life. I mean, as if it hadn't shattered enough already with the exile and the whole uh, painful history of, 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 the, of the Hebrew people. Uh, in in the first century BC, first century AD, the, the whole country is is is, is divided profoundly, uh, even to the extent that somebody like Josephus, the historian who gives us all this information about John, um, he himself rejected uh, the larger interpretation that was going on in Jerusalem in his day, and he went to live in Rome. He was a guest of 
of, of the Flavian dynasty. He called himself Flavius Josephus, and he abandoned completely the nationalist uh, uh, Judean cause, and he called the zealots bandits, or uh, uh, well, that was his, his common name for them, bandits. They were just they were just causing trouble. So you've got to sh- you know there is no normative Judaism in the first century. The rabbinic concept developed much later the second, third, fourth century, and then subsequently in Europe uh, after the diaspora. So in the first century, we're, we're still trying to find, what is this? There is no Judaism. <laughs> Interesting. <clears throat> um, let's, kind of, yeah, right. let's kind of shift our gear. You know, you've been talking about Josephus and how he wrote about John the Baptist in his writings. And, and I'm just curious because, you know, obviously you've investigated this. John the Baptist shows up in Josephus' writing, but does Jesus show up? And if he does, you know, what kind of percentage, you know, does just does John the Baptist show up as, you know, more prominently yeah, than Jesus? It, I mean, I just am curious, you know. Very interesting question, Rita. I think that's a really interesting question because uh, – Jesus does not show up in Josephus's writing, except of a disputed passage, which uh, most scholars, I think all scholars today would say, was an interpolation where Jesus uh, is referred to and there's a sort of sudden statement, and he was the Messiah. No, it's, it's totally out of the context of the narrative. Somebody's put that in. The Josephus texts were uh, transmitted over time. Um, you know, if you want to believe that, you can. But uh, I think you're you're going against uh, the sense of scholarship there. But where is a figure that um, Josephus does mention, uh, who is important, is James, the brother of Jesus, who is referred to in Josephus. So, if we have a brother, then presumably we have the other brother somewhere. But either Josephus doesn't want to write about Yeshua ben Yusuf, you know, Jesus, for some reason. Or what he had to say was removed by copyists later. So there's a mystery over it. All right, now I'm just curious, but what did they say about James? See, I, I never even heard that. So, ah, you, you won't, because it's not in the interests of the Christian churches to it's make it. Secret. <laughs> well, James, J- Jesus' brother, Jacob, uh, James being our English version of it, was murdered uh, in front of the temple in 62 AD. Um, four years before the Jewish revolt started. And he had a big following. He's, he's written about by a Jewish historian called Hegesippus. And uh, poor James was a holy man. He's described as a Zadik, which means a righteous man, whose knees were, he, he was on his knees praying for the salvation of his people so often that they'd become um, bony and knobbly and, and he could hardly walk, you know, they're all of that. He, he was a holy man who prayed for his people. He's he's called the G, uh, brother of Jesus. He's called the brother of Jesus by St. Paul in the first chapter of Galatians. And we know Jesus had a brother of this name. Now, he was the, apparently the leader of whatever organization uh, Jesus was, was part of. Now, I find it very interesting that uh, Josephus gives historical record to the brother, uh, but doesn't say anything about Jesus that we that we know of. It would be unsafe as a historian to then conclude much from that. As I say, there could have been a little section on Jesus or a big section, but it's been removed. But clearly, from the way Josephus writes, he was not of those people who thought that the Messiah had been born in his time. But that would I would have been very surprised if he had thought so. But he does write about James and. Um, the thing is that Josephus was born in uh, 36, 37 AD. Uh, I'd say 37 AD is in my date for the crucifixion, which I argue in the book I think has been misdated to 30, 33. I think that's a complete error. Um, I think Jesus was crucified in 37 AD at Passover, about the time of the uh, murder of Tiberius. And uh, I think when we, when we look at that period, Josephus himself was only a toddler or a baby, He's very, if you read the book at that period, there are about five or six years when he's very vague about it. He, I don't think he either knows or he doesn't want to talk about it. But, you know, I'm afraid 
the fact we've got anything, any historical record of that period. Um, uh, it, it, it's fascinating. We wouldn't know that John was a historical figure without Josephus at all. And I think that gives us a great... Uh, one of the things I love about uh, why I, I'm, I'm curiously attracted to my book, even as if somebody else had written it, is at last I'm getting close to the history. Mm-hmm. Rather than what people subsequently have believed. How I'm, true or accurate do you think Josephus was... Um, with his writing, do you think he was um, objective, or do you think there might be some spin on how he presents the information that he does? Yeah, I think that I think what we know of his life story, he wrote a most wonderful account of his own life, um, suggests that he had a point of view, but he, he is remarkably objective about things. For a historian of his time, he's not a propagandist, he, but he has a point of view. He wants the, He's writing for Romans, effectively, Romans, Greek-speaking people, uh, scholars. He's, he's saying that the Jewish people have this incredible history. You have misjudged us, he's saying, if you think we are just a bunch of terrorists trying to mess up the Roman Empire in the first century. We have a wonderful tradition. We have been let down by extremists, uh, but this is how it happened. This is why. And he even came out and said that Vespasian, the Roman, the Roman general who, 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 who with, with Titus, conquered the Jewish revolt in 66 to 73 AD. He, he says that he is the, uh, he's the expected uh, redeemer of the East. And it's an amazing position. So clearly he's not a zealot. He's not a nationalist uh, Judean. He has a point of view on it. He, he, his view is that, the glo- as far as I can tell, the glory of Judea uh, will come again because it has a spiritual content and will come to light again. And so he writes from this point of view that he, want, he wants to glorify the past of the Jewish people. Um, but he's well aware of the problems, the realistic problems of his own time. And he's gone over to Rome, so that obviously affects him. So... Is he objective? No, no more than any other historian writing about their uh, about their own times. How can anyone write objectively about their own times? We're all born on one side or the other. Well, and from what I understand, during the period that Jesus lived and taught, it was kind of a messianic period where everyone was claiming to be the Messiah. And so what would really separate Jesus out from all of these other people? Well, uh, as far as we can tell, we're not sure that in his own time he was separated out. This was a, all we know is that people came to believe this about him uh, after, his, after the crucifixion and after stories of his resurrection became current. We have no evidence that Jesus was making any impact historically in his own time at all. It was, you know, it, this was minor history. This was backwater stuff. Can you imagine uh, a meeting in the Second World War at Yalta discussing the progress of the war, uh, adding details of what was happening in Nebraska? You know, it was remote from the main power uh, organization of history. It doesn't become of serious interest to the emperor until until there's a war and at that point the house of david becomes a suspect house as we know from mm. records interesting so you've spoke about josephus how do how does his writing uh, regarding john the baptist parallel or not relate at all to what we actually find in the new testament where they talk about john yeah, I, th- I, I, I mean, <clears throat> some would say that Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, whoever wrote it, uh, perhaps somebody called Luke, uh, why not, um, had read some of Josephus' uh, uh, manuscripts uh, because there are some interesting ties in. Uh, my, my own view is that the, 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 the Gospels are not interested in history unless it can be used to pump up the main message, Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is Lord is what the Gospels are about. Uh, And Josephus is writing about, well, actually, the lords of the time were 
Tiberius or Caligula, uh, Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, he's writing about the real world. Uh, the Gospels are writing about the messianic kingdom. They're writing about a religious ideal, which is somehow uh, growing in the world, but it's their ideal. But they're not interested. They're not interested in. They're not historical works. It's a bit like what we call a palimpsest. A palimpsest is an old manuscript on which something was once written, but because manuscripts were expensive, they used to rub out what had been written on them and write again. But when you read a palimpsest, you can sort of see uh, the old writing coming underneath it. I think it's the same with a lot of the Gospels. You can see the history sort of poking through here and there. Uh, and, and there is a historical context, but it's obscure. Certainly the Gospel writers were not interested in telling you uh, what you would want to know from, from a news programme. The, their idea is, who cares whether Caligula is backed by Macro and kills Tiberius? Well, what's happening is Jesus is walking on the water. That's what's happening. That's, that's reality. You know, these are, these are the works of a new a new sect a new a new religious community and their their obsessions are their own uh, they're not historical uh, they use history in the way that um you know i suppose if you had a very far out view uh, and you said well yeah and and you called up you summoned the idea that well we've been to the moon therefore we can go to you know alpha centauri <laughs> you know what i mean it's 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 like that they're not a, it's not also, of course, the, to the Christians, the early church, the time process anyway was about to end, so they weren't interested in history as history anyway. We're interested in history because we're living 2,000 years later, we can see that there's a story. So we can tell history as a story. Um, we know the world didn't end. We know that Jesus didn't come again on a cloud of power in the first century. We know that the Roman Empire suffered uh, the downfall of so many empires, which was a long protracted process we know it wasn't miraculous and so we're in a completely different position our, our our attempt to understand what might have happened in the early first century we can only work on the evidence and again we can pick up these spiritual ideas of course we can pick up spiritual ideas. you have spiritual ideas i have them we we we're look we're all looking for some kind of um understanding of why we feel and think the way we do and if religion offers that, that's great. Or if history offers some uh, support, that's fine. Um, you, do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things I was thinking with you talking um, was, you know, the Bible, the New Testament makes Jesus seem like this very important character you know and and very well loved and you know everybody was following him around and you know and it just made me think of you know the story of the five fish and two loaves two you know two of fish five loaves that story where he he feeds the masses you know and then in my little sick mind i'm thinking well maybe there weren't that many people and five fish and two loaves was enough uh, <laughs> they just made it sound like there was a big crowd um yeah, I think I, I think all of these stories, what what their root was in the the time they had, we don't know. But they were all told. They were told and went into currency considerably later. And it's rather like today, if you were trying to say to an Indian boy or girl about Mahatma Gandhi, and everything because Mahatma Gandhi is now a venerated figure because he's significant in the history of India. Everything he did is significant. So if you found a letter that he'd written to, you know, somebody, that letter will be sold for a lot of money and its meaning will be magnified. And I think by the time, by the time that the, the Gospels were in currency, uh, real currency, second century, Jesus has already become a, a, a legendary figure. So every, everything about him is big. And they're not, people aren't really interested in John the Baptist. He gets in the way. Because he's a historical character, the people are now interested in salvation, you know. And Jesus's significance is whether I'm saved or not. Not, you know, what did he have for breakfast? Who his friends were? What was the nature of his organisation? How did he relate? And so, the historical aspects of his life become de uh, are gradually defocused. 
And of course, after the Jewish revolt anyway, it was very hard to preach the Christian message of repent and adopt the king, uh, become part of the kingdom of heaven uh, by referring to early Jewish his, uh, to early first century Jewish history because it was compromised history. Um, as far as the Romans were concerned, they were dealing with a revolting, <laughs> literally revolting part of the empire. Now, you didn't want Jesus mixed up with all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Now, John is a political, primarily a political religious figure. His message that we know historically was political. He was opposing the rule of Herod Antipas, his right to choose his own wife against the religious customs of the Jewish people. And that is a political religious situation. So is uh, that why they killed him? Well, I, Herod probably was most reluctant, as people are today, most reluctant to kill John because John was much loved by a lot of people. He obviously had a huge following. Uh, he had a church. He had a church. We don't know this. There was a John church. There was a John church. It may even still exist today in northern Iraq, parts of America, England. There were followers of John who regard him as the greatest prophet alive. That is another important aspect of the book. How does the John tradition go on? Now, the mainstream Christian tradition doesn't want to know about this, but it's a fact. You have to a religion, a worldwide, a world religion now because it's because of the invasion of Iraq. The Mandeans have, 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 have fl had to, many of them have had to flee the country, flee Iraq from the Shatal out of marshes where there were uh, a dominant uh, presence. Uh, they are now in you know, the United Kingdom, in the USA, Sweden, various places. Now, the Mandeans, which is from a Aramaic word meaning knowledge, gnosis, hold John to be the primary prophet, the last prophet, and and their most revered figure after Adam. And they construct little tributaries off the Tigris River in Iraq. You can see them on the internet. Look it up, Mandean, and you will see that they baptize people. In, in these and, and these little tributaries of the Tigris in Iraq are called Jordans. The holy men are called Nazariah, which is the, clearly the Arabic version of the Nazarene word applied to Jesus' first followers. So John had a church. Paul opposed them. You have that evidence in the Acts of the Apostles and in Galatians. He, he says, oh, John's thing is just water. So, yeah, my, my book is really uh, just saying, well, just saying, you know, uh, John, at the, for, the, for the elevation of Jesus, uh, the truth of John, Jesus' relationship with John has been cast aside. And I'm trying to rebalance that and show that John was a vital spiritual figure in the first century, as he is to people today in the 21st century. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock. We have 10 minutes, and this is kind of like... <laughs> The, the $100,000 question, I think. So what do you think would have happened if John had, had been released and not killed? Do you think history would have played out differently? Yeah, of course. If John had been released, Jesus hasn't got a, an individual message because his first message, according to the Gospels, was repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, that's John's message. So you can't have really, you'd have had two right. You ended up with two rival preachers saying the same thing. Um, so, no, uh, John's uh, execution is curiously uh, uh, to the advantage of uh, the Jesus following. My personal view is that they were actually in the same organization, working on the same platform um, at some point, and that the trauma of John's arrest uh, sent ripples around the whole movement, and Jesus came forth out of that to lead uh, the, some, some of John's following. But it was primarily John's following that started the whole thing. And uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is. The curious thing is, as I say, that John won't lie down. Uh, I don't think he'll lie down because I think he, he was a major, he was a, he was a son of man like Jesus. The phrase son of man means one who has witnessed the glory of the Lord. Uh, glory, the glory of God uh, as a man. And uh, John was a son of man, as, as was Ezekiel, as was Moses, as was uh, Elijah, as was Jesus. 
this phrase, the son of man, when we go into it. And there will be other sons of men, and we know there are, who've suffered uh, for this very pure vision of God uh, and our uh, celestial, if you like, or super celestial identity. Well, there is a comment in the chat room that I'm just going to repeat, and this is Jim's comment. So Jesus' followers had John killed so he wouldn't have competition? Well, I don't know why you'd kill your your your, your friends. <laughs> I didn't need to kill him. Uh, Herod Antipas could do it for you. you know? But, uh, no, I, 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 think, uh, I think that uh, Josephus is the only historical record we have, and he makes it absolutely plain that Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who himself was a pretty mass murderer, uh, would have thought not too much, perhaps, about um, knocking off this uh, this dangerous uh, preacher of hate, I expect you'd have called him, right? We do today. Some of the Islamic uh, extremists, they say, he, he's, he's not, uh, you know, he's not, he's not, he's gone too far, this fellow. John's gone too far. Um, he doesn't know what he, you know, I, I think it was an expedient political move to kill John, not the um, subterranean conspiracy of Jesus' followers. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Though, I mean, uh, the, the, the historical complexity of the movement is lost to us. We don't have uh, information to make wild... Uh, you can write books uh, on, on uh, conjectures and speculation, but I don't do that. I like to get to the... I'm trying to get to the evidence and, 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 and work with that. And, and, and other people have said, you know, oh, John was in the way. Get rid of him. Well, OK, show me some evidence where he was got rid of by his own followers. There isn't any. And what else am I supposed to go on? Am I supposed to imagine what happened <laughs> all the time? Well, there are so many people that do, and I just really appreciate you just putting out what it, the facts are and what is known and keeping your thoughts and opinions, you know, to yourself, so to speak. Because well, there, there really are a lot of people that will put out their conjectures and then say, oh, well, this is a fact. And that really pisses me off. <laughs> well, I, I was trained not to do that, and 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 I'm. I think we'll all. You're going to. You know, are we interested in the truth, or that which we would like to believe? Well, but even when you have the facts, you can come to your own conclusion based on those facts, and not based on somebody else's. You know, spun up opinion. Yeah, of course. Of course, I had to say when I was a young. Younger, younger man. Um, I had to. Uh, I had to go on what I was told, and my opinions were formed on the basis of the knowledge at my disposal. Uh, my opinions now are formed on the knowledge. If there's new knowledge, we'll have new opinions. So we shouldn't be too sure of our opinions, mine or or anybody else's, of course. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't believe there's. There's a, I think there's a conspiracy of ignorance, if you like. Uh, the, the human tendency is to be lazy and um, a little bit cowardly, really, and not face the issues of our life and time. We, we, we'd, we'd rather have the soft option, and that colors the way we think. And you, it turn, takes a certain amount of discipline, etc., ex experience, courage, to get, get out of that. Um, but there have been many books which I think are, are just are speculative for the sake of it and for the sake of sales. I, I, that's not my bag. I'm, I'm, I'm an old fan. My, my ancestor, Ralph Cherson, back in the 1790s, wrote a defense of the Church of England, which cost him dear because he got a lot of opposition for having written it. But he said that there's only one thing worth contending for, and that is the truth. And I try to, I personally try to follow that. So I'm not... I could I could weave you tales which would make your head spin, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think if John, you know, kind of sticking with that last question I asked, because um, we have about three minutes, um, sticking with that last question, if John hadn't been killed, do you think his movement um, would have caught on like what happened with Jesus? Or maybe even a different question. I'm going to throw out a different question. How come when John died, we didn't get the kind of movement that we got with the death of Jesus? That's a better question. 
Yeah, it is a better question. My God, I wish we had another 30 minutes for that I one. I know, but this hour went way too fast, I way too fast. I appreciate with that question. I think it's a wonderful question. Yes, I mean, uh, quick reaction to that. Gosh, what can I say? Um, I, I think, yes, I think a John movement would have been a real possible movement in the ancient world. Uh, we know that major religious figures of that time had followings for two, three hundred years. I could, I could name half a dozen. And I'm sure John also had a church. What, what the John movement didn't have was Paul. Uh, I think Paul made all the difference. If you can imagine the poor old followers of Jesus, James, his wonderful holy brother, and, and Peter, rather frightened people, not all of them terribly bright. Uh, where would they have been without this, this Paul who suddenly comes along and says, I'll show you how to make this a world movement. And if John had had a Paul, uh, now maybe John had Simon Magus. Uh, there's a, we haven't got time to go into this, but John, John did have a serious following amongst uh, early Gnostics. Well, wouldn't that have been wonderful to talk about, uh, which I talk about in the book. But uh, Jesus ha ended up with Paul, and what we get is Paul's version of Jesus such as it is. And Paul was a genius. He was brilliant. I, I take my hat off. He was off. a marketing expert. He, he, he's almost, the, he's outside of his time. The guy, the guy is, uh, I, I, I can't find the words for this man. He's so extraordinary historically. There's nobody like him in the first century. He's, a, he's amazing. And, and he, so yes, the Jesus movement got Paul. And of course, they've also had to live with Paul. And that's how we all. Well, the music's going to come up here in a second, so why don't you go ahead and give out like your web page, where people can get your book, all that good information. What, you want me to say stuff like that? I, yeah. yeah I don't <laughs> you want me to just say it for you? No. <laughs> yeah, you do, do it for me, Rita. You, you're, you're a professional. <laughs> okay. So if you'd like to get a copy of Tobias Churton, Churton's, of Tobias Churton's new book, The Mysteries of John the Baptist. It's available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, probably at your local bookstore. If you ask them real nice, they can order you a copy. And if you and your other books, I'm assuming they're available at all the regular distributors as well? Yes, all of them. Yeah. All of them. And to get more information about Tobias, go to his website, TobiasChurton.com. Tobias, you were a pleasure. I wish I had you for two hours, but we'll just have to do it again. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I will talk to you again soon. Okay? Thanks a lot, Rita. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. That, that's Tobias Churton, his book, uh, Mysteries of John the Baptist. And we're going to be back with Gene Manley after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. 